that's Terry's cat. <laughs> Bark cat. <laughs> I'll start in 10 seconds. I'll start on my own recording now. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you and welcome to the City of Brisbane Joint City Council and Housing Authority meeting of Thursday, October 15th, 2020. And if the city clerk could read the preamble, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This meeting is compliant with the governor's executive order N-29-20 issued on March 17th, 2020, allowing for deviation of teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide the safest, safest environment for staff, council members, and the public while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action in any item listed in the agenda. Members of the public may view the city council meeting by logging into the zoom meeting listed below city council meetings can also be viewed live and or on demand via the city's YouTube channel www.youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27 archived videos can be replayed on the city's website http forward slash forward slash Brisbane CA dot org forward slash meetings it's addressed to council. The city council meeting will be an ex exclusively virtual meeting. The city council agenda materials may be viewed online at www.brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom meeting, the following email and text line will also be monitored using the meeting and public comments received will be read into the record during oral communications one and two or during an item. Please email ipadilla at brisbaneca.org, text 628-219-2922, or join the Zoom meeting with a meeting ID 932-9180-5170 with a passcode 123456 and the call in number at one 669-900-9128. If you need special assistance to participate in this meeting, please contact the city clerk at 415-508-2113. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to call the uh, meeting to order. And will you please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember Conway. Present. Councilmember Cunningham. Present. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Lent. Here. And Mayor O'Connell. Present. And can we get a report out from our closed session, please? Yes, the council gave, uh, I reported on the, the uh, Holly Holstein matter, I'm sorry, don't have my note in front of me. And council gave me direction to act on prior to the next council meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, can I get an adoption of the agenda? Move adoption as printed. And a second. I'll second that. Thank you. And a roll call vote, please. Council Member Conway. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lent. Aye. And Mayor O'Connor. Aye. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to oral communications number one. Opportunity for members of the public to speak on items not on the agenda. Do we have anyone? in the waiting room wishing to speak or who have sent in a uh, written request. There are no text messages, emails, or any member of the public wishing to speak. Thank you. So we will move on to item number five, the consent calendar. Madam Mayor, I'd like to remove uh, item D, please. I'm sorry, was that B or D? D is in David. B, D, D is, is in, in D is David. in David. Okay, with that, do I have a motion to approve item 
A, B, C, and E. So moved. Second. And a second. Second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Conway? Aye. Council Member Cunningham? Aye. Council Member Davis? You're muted. Aye. Council Member Lent? Aye. And Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Thank you. And that brings us to item D. Is this because you'd like to recuse yourself? Yeah, so I'd just like to uh, um, not vote on this since I didn't participate in the public hearing. I think it's appropriate to just keep it assist, uh, consistent, even though legally I can vote on it, but I prefer not to. Okay, so with that, is there any other discussion on item D or members of the public who would like to speak on that? I'll make a motion to approve item D of the consent calendar. And, and a second. Second it. Okay. And were there any members of the public wishing to speak? Um, that, Madam Mayor, there's no text, emails, or any members of the public wishing to speak. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to a roll call vote. Council Member Conway. Abstained. Accused. Um, Council, Council Member Cunningham? Aye. Council Member Davis? You're muted, Madison. Aye. Council Member Lent? Aye. And Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Thank you very much. That brings us to new business. Item F, to consider use of housing authority funds to assist low, moderate renters and homeowners with payments due to COVID-19 related issues and the council will be considering whether to allocate $100,000 of housing authority low income funds for the purpose of rental and mortgage assistance. Staff report, please. Yes, this is an item that the at different times council members have expressed an interest in helping renters and people with mortgage payments that have been affected by COVID. And staff did a little bit of research as to what was the what was one method that we could use to do that, and what staff was he thought thought was an appropriate idea was to use the low mod housing fund to do that. That we could allocate a, a, up to one hundred thousand dollars. There are many different programs throughout the state that are available for us to model it off of. So at this time, we don't have a specific idea of exactly how the program would work but we wanted to get an idea if this is something that the city council wanted us to pursue further. Um, the issue being for a, a number of the renters and people with mortgage payments who are affected by COVID is that they are being able allowed to postpone their payments while they are impacted by financially by COVID, but at some point they are going to need to make those payments in the future. By having the city step in and help those people, they will not fall further behind in their mortgages or their rents once it's required by law for them to repay them. That's a very brief report. If you want more information, we're happy to give it, but this is an idea. This is something that the city council wants us to come back with, with a full program. So for a little background, um, I would just like clarification, <clears throat> right, at, right at this point, mortgage um, mortgages are being able to be deferred and they're not going to be where they're going to need to make a balloon payment, like with rents, once uh, COVID is over, they'll be tacked on to the end of the loan. So if you had a 30 year loan and you didn't make payments for a year, you'd basically be extending your loan period for another year. Um, and I think that that is a very different um, person that we're trying to help than it would be to actual low income uh, renters. And I would just like to put that out there because I've done a little discussion um, on on how that works. And, you know, it, it isn't going to be, you know, a tremendous financial burden to the homeowners that do that deferment. Um, and I also understand that for our other low income uh, assistant program, that the city have had, we do not compile the data to determine if someone is low or moderate income. 
we use a third party system where we will look at someone's PG&E bill. If they qualify for the CARE program, then they would qualify for our assistance that we give in certain things like, you know, school pass, you know, bus passes and, you know, help on your utility bills. But we don't really compile that data and don't really want to be, and Stuart can correct me, in the business of compiling that data on our residents. So I just wanted to put that out there as some background that I understand, and we can open this up for discussion. Uh, I, mean, oh, I was pointing at Madison because she had her finger up first. Then we can go to Clark. You can go first, Clark. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that, that's fine. Um, I, I suggest that we kind of work with the uh, county who probably has more um, um, pertinent data or collecting the data. And that, you know, a lot of people who traditionally, I guess, traditionally weren't low and moderate income or low income uh, may have been knocked into that bracket from the COVID of getting laid off. And now all of a sudden uh, they're on unemployment and uh, they have rent. So um, yeah, I think the county has the ability in the data to collect that as long as people apply and then maybe have our staff work with the county to, to see uh, how many of our citizens uh, qualify for that. You know, and, and how would we get the word out to our citizens? You know, there's a lot of uh, things without making it too complicated, you know, because the idea is to really get the money out there to them. You know, so uh, I would say having our staff work with uh, uh, county, I would I would certainly be in favor of doing something like this. I think it's appropriate at this time. Um, a lot of people, you know, have been you know devastated by this. You know, not just those who've lost loved ones, but you know, also financially. So I think it's very appropriate. So um, the county has a couple different models for this. One is they um, have distributed funds through. Um, SMC Strong. So SMC Strong has like three. Madison, can you speak up, please? SMC Strong has three tiers. So one tier for business, one tier for um, assistance to families, and then one tier for nonprofit organizations. And so there is a model in which they just they're distributing money to families. So that's one thing we can look at. But launching this week is a new program through the city, which is all about. Um, small working with small landlords we could do a hybrid type model where um, what's interesting about the program with landlords is that the county is paying for the back rent but they're paying 80% of the balance due and so in exchange the landlord has to forgive a hundred percent of the balance so, and then the payments made directly to the landlord. So that way uh, the money can stretch a little bit further because the landlord is accepting 80% uh, for a 100% forgiveness. And then the payments made directly to the landlord. So you know that the payments not somehow getting spent on other things. And then those people aren't actually using it to make that balloon rent payment at some point so that could be like a nice hybrid model that we could look into yeah that's great go ahead karen so um um there's even with all of these great programs and yes we we're working with oes and all the different programs coming together are fantastic but there's still some people who are definitely falling between the cracks and you know, maybe if what we put out sort of addresses the fact that there's all these programs through the county that are doing an amazing job um, and just just make sure if it's going wherever we're putting the information out that we're trying to capture those people who still don't qualify for any of these other programs for whatever reason. Um, because we, we know there's there's still people who are hurting really badly, even with all of these other lifelines. So I, I love the fact that we're thinking about this. And I think we should definitely run the program ourselves 
Um, and sometimes like what I'm noticing is that the money is there and the application window opens up and it's gone. Yep. And a lot of times they do it based on population. So like SMC strong, one business got a grant. So I think, um, there's a way that we could oversee the program, but there's already all this infrastructure in place that we could borrow policies, how they're checking the need and what they're asked, what kind of information they're asking for. And then people come and they provide that on their own. Um, and I don't think it's really stored, but, um, applicants come forward and say, yes, I want this assistance. Yeah, no, I think what everyone has said is just fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad that our council is in favor of moving forward with, uh, some kind of program. You're right, Madison, there's so many different programs out there. And, and I know you mentioned that too, Karen, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, I think is really great from the County is that program where, uh, it doesn't matter what your, uh, legal status is. Right. And we, and who knows, you know, what the makeup is of all of our, uh, citizens in our town, but you know, we, no one should be disqualified, you know, because of that. And so, uh, so I have a question for staff. Are you, are you just asking for from guidance from the council if yeah, this is something we want to do, and then you'll go out and, and try and find the right programs that are the best fit uh, for Brisbane and then bring that back for council, uh, council's final approval. Correct. That is what there's a number of programs, as you've mentioned in the County, but there's also programs as I found in other cities throughout the state that are doing one specifically for their cities and trying to figure out what the best one is for Brisbane. I just wanted to make sure that this was still something that the city council was in favor of doing because although individual council members have talked about this, we've never brought this forward to the city council at for a overall decision. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And then, you know, I know that, uh, uh, the mayor brought up the, uh, the situation where, uh, banks, uh, I guess, are they required to, um, you know, defer those payments, like, you know, extend the, the, the length of the loans if the, um, if the person that has the mortgage requests it, is that an automatic if they fill out the paperwork or it, it's not, it qualify, some people qualify and some others don't. So, so um, I, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead, Tom, if you have a legal opinion. Uh, I just want to, um, what the mayor was describing is a program that's being challenged legally, but it's one of many and there, I think the one the mayor is describing will survive. But some of them are voluntary, some of them are, are by county ordinance, some of them are by state law, just two. But still, uh, they're all out there and some will be fine. I think the one that's being challenged, the mayor described, will be fine. Um, that's, I thought you were asking the, the legal question, but I think it's wise for the city, if you're gonna do this, to look to see which model's not being challenged. So that you're going down that path. If it works. Yes. Thank Mike, you. Thank you. Um, the, the maybe only lose my train of thought for a moment. Um, I'm going to blame it on the kitty cat, but uh, <laughs> I think it's it's something that the many of the rental homes that we have in Brisbane are owned by Brisbane people, and so doing a rent assistance for renters is going to help those business people, those uh, landlords also um, with their financial responsibilities. Yeah. And so you're almost getting the money to you be used twice in many situations mm -hmm. for people here in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a double use if you really try to steer this towards rentals and 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 work out some sort of deal. I think that what Madison described that um, other county entities are using, I think makes sense to look at. And I also would like to ask if the state has given us approval to use our housing authority funds in this manner, or could this come back to bite us? 
I mean, I've talked to the both attorneys, I've talked to both Michael and Tom, both Michael and Tom have told me that this would, as long as we ensure that the money is being used for people who would qualify for a low moderate housing assistance, that this would qualify as part of, uh, would qualify for that. These particular funds. Right. I mean, we would not be doing it for just anybody you'd have to qualify based on being, you know, being low moderate. And, you know, what one of the cities has done is say that it's 80% of the AMI versus, you know, moderate would be 120%. So I think that would be one of the ideas that when we bring back the program, specifically who we want to help, do we want to help both low and moderate income people or just low income people? Um, what I'm hearing from the mayor is that maybe one of the aspects of the program is that the house that the rented property needs to be owned by somebody who lives in Brisbane? Because we're creating our own program, we can create that kind of specific criteria if you would like. Yeah, I, I was not trying to suggest that we limit it to uh, okay. tenants of people who are, you know, homes that are owned by Brisbane residents. I think that that will be an unintended benefit for many of our renters here in Brisbane but it would not necessarily be something I would look for as a qualifier. Okay. Um, but I would, you know, I think that it could have that unintended consequence of helping both the landlord and the renter um, to, to seek a balance. So um, with that, I think that um, we could give a recommendation to Stuart. Do we need this to be a vote to allocate a hundred thousand dollars not yet madam mayor there's not a program to allocate it to um if, if i may madam mayor then uh, I, I guess we're asking staff to develop a program and then maybe uh, run it through the affordable housing subcommittee that that's reasonable staff feedback I would think that this would need to come back to the council to allocate those kind of funds. Certainly, if the affordable housing committee wants to look at it first, their recommendation would be certainly appreciated by the council. Okay, it sounds like a, a, a two-step process. One is to allocate the money, and then the second one is to develop a program. Is that, is that correct? I think it's the other way around. Right. I think what we need to do is have a pro. What we would do is we would bring the program to the city council at that point in time. You approve the program and the allocation. Okay. Then we all at once. Then I would suggest that they work with the subcommittee first to vet out, you know, any questions and stuff, and then bring it to the full council. You know? Sure. So, if that's how that how they would like to do it, then that works. So do you need further direction or just a big thumbs up from us? A big thumbs up is, is good enough on this since there's no direct action. Cliff, any thumbs yeah, up? You know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm totally good. And, and you know, um, you know, just to be clear, I think what, what you were saying, Madam Mayor, that it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, a property owner in Brisbane of their rentals. Uh, you know, I think we need to be broad. Of course, it's, it's, it's about staying in Brisbane. So, um, yeah, does this bring us the, those different models, Stuart? And, um, yeah, really looking forward to, are we expecting to, to put it on the next agenda so that we can get this thing going? Um, I, you know, I think if we're going to have the subcommittee meeting, I mean, my hope was to bring it back to the city council by the November, uh, second meeting in November. So, uh, you know, there are, there are models out there, but I think to make sure that we have it tailored for Brisbane, it was going to take more than just a week to turn something around. Okay. Well, um, I mean, I, I know that there's a recommendation to have it go before the, the, the subcommittee. I'm on a subcommittee. I mean, I, I, I mean, if it's going to delay it by another council meeting, uh, I would prefer just to bring it to the council um, because I think it's an important program. And I think there's a lot of uh, different programs that we could choose from and, and, and I, I have confidence in the in staff to, to put forth a few models that that really make sense for us so right and also just to let you know that a lot of the rental 
deferral is through the end of December at this point. I think it may have been extended through the end of into January. So there isn't as much time pressure to get it to the next agenda, to the next one, but we do want to make sure that we get this in place before the end of the year. Okay. That's why I was thinking the, November, the second meeting in November would be time would be timely enough. Okay. Well, then then that gives us gives us enough time for you to do something, bring it to the subcommittee, and then get some feedback and put it on the agenda. Okay. Great. Thank you. And I'm glad that we uh, have the ability and the finances to be able to do this for our citizens. With that, it brings us to staff reports and the city manager's report on upcoming activities. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think Ingrid's going to put up uh, some uh, PowerPoint for us. Um, we've got quite a few items tonight, but I think they're all important and um, need uh, some level of uh, discussion. We'll be putting a lot of this information out in the blast tomorrow also. Um, so on the first item, the uh, Bay Area health uh, officials have put out a joint press release urging residents to get their flu shots. Symptoms of the flu can be similar to early symptoms of COVID-19, meaning that this year people with the flu symptoms may require COVID-19 tests and may need to stay at home from work um, and isolate from their families while awaiting test results. Uh, but they're strongly encouraged to get uh, get their flu shots. Um, we've got a number of events coming up um, on the 24th of October. Uh, these include the Brisbane Lions Club uh, Walk and Run, which will be at 9 a.m. Um, we will be having the dedication of our new Brisbane Library at 10 a.m. Um, the Brisbane Lions Club Free Flu Clinic or free, free, free flu shot clinic will be at 10 a.m. on that day, as well as their uh, pumpkin patch. Just a reminder to everyone that the uh, ballot drop box outside of City Hall is um, up and running. Um, it's being serviced by uh, county election staff on uh, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and we are seeing a fairly steady um, uh, walk up um, in uh, use of that uh, that option in terms of uh, voting. So that's that's good to see. So the next item is um, the uh, uh, county has been, um, as uh, I think council members are aware, um, members of the community may not be quite as aware, has been re really aggressively trying to get um, um, the number of tests um, increased. Uh, and this is all part of the uh, county strategy to um, get us um, into a less restrictive um, uh, color coding. Um, so if anybody who um, wants to do a test is um, welcome to sign up on Monday, October 26th from 5 to 8 p.m. The county is going to be running this program. Um, it's going to be done at our community pool location at 2 Solano. Um, and uh, you can get information on our website at uh, Brisbane COVID testing. Oh, and one other thing is at San Mateo County Convention Center um, Monday through Friday, starting on Tuesday, they're going to be able to test children. And I know that's been a challenge, like a lot of um, a lot of these testing sites won't test children. So um, I think it's until 8 p.m., maybe 9 to 8 or 1 to 8. I'm not exactly sure of the time frame, but I know it, it ends at 8. So for children five and up, you can get them COVID testing at the convention center. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madison. Um, also, just uh, with regards to the one we'll be doing here at our pool, um, that is limited to uh, 50, the first 50 uh, registrants. So um, if you're interested, uh, sign up quickly. So the next item is the um, Great Plates Program. Um, the, the great, uh, great Plates Delivered Program, which provides three nutritious meals per day to qualifying seniors, has been extended through November 9th. You can find more information on the city's website at brisbaneca.org by searching Great Plates Delivered. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department also continues to provide lunches to seniors in town on Mondays in partnership with the Lions Club 
and Wednesdays in partnership with the Samaritan House. You can get more information regarding this on our community calendar or by calling Steve Beatty in our Parks and Recreation Department, and he can be reached at 508-2114. I think this was mentioned earlier in the meeting, but I'll just mention it again. The Small Properties Owners Assistance Program that's being run by the county is open and will be running for two weeks. For more information, you can go to the city's website under City News and pick that up at brisbaneca.org slash news if you're interested in that program. The Crocker Trail Master Plan Community Workshop is scheduled for Wednesday the 21st at 6.30 p.m. This will be the first meeting. It will be held online via Zoom. The master plan will highlight opportunities desired by the community and stakeholders to improve the connectivity and safety, preserve local sensitive environments, promote recreation on the trail, embrace public art and interpretive education, and plan for the trail's legacy. You can find information about joining this meeting on the community calendar at brisbaneca.org slash calendar. Clay, if I may ask a question, if council members just wanted to sit in and just listen, is that okay? I'm going to defer to the city attorney on that one. And I don't know, maybe Tom, you want to think about that and get back to the council later. You can sit there. There's an appearance question, but you'd have to not, you'd literally not be able to participate at all. Yeah, just, you know, no screen, no audio, just hang out and listen. You just listen. I'm really curious to hear, you know, the input from the community members. Okay, let's move on to the next item. So since COVID has been in place here for the last several months, the blood donations have been down very significantly and blood is still very much needed by our local hospitals. As many of you are aware, we have a blood donation facility right here in Brisbane. Vitalant is located at 400 Valley Drive and has been holding monthly community blood drives. The next drive is happening this Friday, or excuse me, Friday, October 30th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Again, this information is on the city's calendar if you're interested in donating blood. Who can I add to that? They also have the capacity to test your blood for COVID antibodies. So if you think you might have had COVID, but you don't know for sure, you can kill two birds with one stone, donate blood, they'll check your blood. And then if they find that you were positive for COVID and you have those antibodies, like at one point you were positive for COVID, they'll be able to use your plasma for people that are fighting the virus right now. Thank you, Madison. And then the next item, for supporting our local nonprofits, we have up until October 30th to submit applications for funding using the Google form found in the news section of our website. As a reminder, the city council at your September 3rd meeting approved $10,000 to be made available to Brisbane-based nonprofits to apply for in an effort to offset some of the costs in terms of not being able to raise funds due to canceled fundraisers during this event. How's the response been, Clay? Stuart, do you have a sense of that at this point? I think Caroline has told me they've had three or four of the nonprofits have put in. Okay, great. Good. And then finally, our annual yard waste dumpster program will happen this year, which is good. And that's going to be on the weekend of November 14th and 15th. And we will have the dumpsters placed out at the various locations. I think they're pretty much the locations that we've used in the last several years. And this is a map of that. We will be putting that map up on our website and making that generally available for the public to see. With that, that completes my report for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Madison. Thank you, Mr. Stewart.
Thank you so much. That'll bring us to mayor and council matters. And we have the countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. Who would like to kick us off on the meetings they've been attending? I will. So I'm on the foundation of the San Mateo County Library, and we had our last meeting talking about the excitement of the opening of the Brisbane Library, which we won't be able to attend. So it's pretty interesting. The library is opening, but you can't come. And how we're going to do some of those services around how they've been operating the library in Huffington Bay. So that's going to be pretty exciting, and we'll learn more about that on the 24th. And then we had a meeting with Metropolitan Transportation Commission. I've got to say I'm pretty disappointed with the way they handle things. Can't look at a Google map and make a decision about Brisbane, but that kind of seems to be where we're going. So I'll reserve comment. Cliff might like to say more about that. But hopefully moving forward, they will actually do a little homework before they come back to us. Can I ask you a question, Karen, about the library? Yeah. So it's my understanding that at the red tier, which we're in right now, libraries are allowed to operate at 50% capacity. So do you know of any other libraries that are operational? It would be great if once the library was stocked with books, if we could have some type of access for the public. So what they're doing is it's all going to be online for now until everything opens. I think they really don't know. I mean, it's just there is so much risk having people inside a library. So people are doing their business relative to the library, checking things in and checking things out, and a drive-by pickup. And then when you bring your library books back to the library and they're doing some deliveries as well, I'm not sure how that's going to work out for Brisbane. But we have a meeting next Monday morning, so I'll know a little bit better after that. So when you check your books back in, those books then go into quarantine for three days. So they've got it all sorted out down in Hoffman and Bain. We'll just be following exactly what they're doing. But there still will be quite a few library services available. One of the great things that's happening through the foundation is that there's been plenty of money that's been raised for doing more online programs. I think, you know, once all of this is all over, there's going to be so much that the libraries offer rather than just book lending, as we've seen in the past. There'll be maker spaces and so much creativity going on in the library that will reach out to everybody in the community. Young and old, people who are not even interested in checking out a book will have plenty of things to do at the library. But so far, they're just really concerned about, you know, contamination. So three days quarantine for everything that goes back to the library. Not sure how we're going to figure out what we're going to do in Brisbane, but again, my meeting is on Monday, so I'll know more. Just to add to what Karen said, the last I've heard from the library manager was that they were certainly going to be closed through the end of the year, but we're hopeful that sometime after the first of the year, they might be able to get into some limited opening. Now, as you know, we are part of a system, and I believe there's 10 libraries in that system. So there will be the same basic rules in terms of how those libraries are operated throughout the system. So there's nothing, no kind of, you know, one-off sorts of situations. But they're anxious to try to get back and get people, you know, in the facilities. And, of course, we're super anxious to do that. But, you know, we're just going to have to be a little bit more patient, at least through the end of the year. And we'll see where we stand by January, February period of time. Wish I had something better to report on that. I think we're getting close. Thank you, Karen. Any other reports, Karen? No. Okay, thank you. Madison, would you like to go next? Okay. Cliff and I met yesterday with the 2x2x2x2. 
and um, it was a lively meeting. And uh, we discussed the possibilities at the Baylands relative to education, um, got a commitment from the Jefferson Union High School District Board um, that their intention is to build a 250 person middle school, 250 person high school. However, they noted that the size proposed was really um, correlated to the 11 acre site that they thought they would be working with and acknowledged that at that size, um, there likely would not be room for everyone who wanted to, to attend the high school to actually be able to go there. Um, but there seemed to be a willingness on their part to explore a larger high school that could accommodate a larger student body um, if there were more acres for them to work with. And, um, there seems to be like a long history of, um, how do I want to put this? Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wound, old wounds, um, there amongst, you know, some of the people that are at the table making these decisions. And so Cliff had suggested that maybe at our next meeting, we hire a professional mediator to help us um, move through some of those old wounds and to finally, I think, come to some type of resolution so that we can really work together effectively. Um, so I am hopeful about the future and I think that we're moving in a good direction. And that's it for me. Kumbaya moment. Yeah. Marshmallows and roast them. We need a retreat, a retreat. Definitely. Yeah. No, I, I thought it was a productive meeting too, Madison. I mean, I, I, I felt that we got to some places that, you know, last year we might not have thought we could get there. I mean, it didn't seem like Jefferson was interested in uh, doing a high school in Brisbane. And then now this year they are. Um, granted, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it's a pretty small footprint. They are uh, both Jefferson and Bayshore uh, are looking to the city to represent them uh, with UPC um, in the form of community benefits. Uh, of course, uh, you know, education is just one of the slices in the community benefit pie that the council has to uh, balance. And so, um, you know, we just need to see, you know, where this takes us and, and uh, hopefully through having a third party, non-biased, you know, independent uh, facilitator uh, with no stake, you know, in the game that, uh, you know, all of the ideas, all of the, the, you know, aspirations can really come to the, to the table and, and, and we put forth a really sound, uh, really sound direction where all the children of our area uh, can benefit. So, um, and then, you know, Karen uh, mentioned the MTC uh, Plan Bay Area 2050 staff meeting that we had with them. Um, uh, yeah, so right now, um, the Plan Bay Area 2050 um, is, is moving forward with this, this uh, notion of, of identifying housing areas all across the Bay Area. And unfortunately, they're using this formula that really doesn't assess what's happening on the ground in all these different areas that they're identifying for housing. Um, and so as you know, right now, ABAG's got a meeting going on, um, but uh, we'll see what they all decide. There's a couple of different versions of, of PBA 2050 that, that could be uh, adopted. Uh, the, the conservative uh, model uh, would, I, I, you know, and, and I know Tom and Clay and are here, um, you know, I believe that over the 30-year the period of 2050, it would increase our housing stock by uh, 450%. Um, and that the first uh, cycle could be 2,800 units. And so we, you know, in this meeting, you know, John created a, a wonderful map that 
was that's in the 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 plan that identified uh, our city and what areas are just not feasible for housing. And um, I thought that by having this meeting, and, and, and I have to say, I mean, it was great that the executive director, Teresa McMillan, convened that meeting very, very quickly, right before the ABAG meeting. And we had um, wonderful support from Supervisor Canapa and uh, Councilwoman Gina Pappen from Millbrae. So Gina is our MTC rep. Uh, you know, David is um, with uh, MTC ABAG. I'm, I'm not exactly sure if he's ABAG or MTC. I think he might be MTC, isn't he? He's ABAG. He's ABAG, okay. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, council oh. member uh, Wayne Lee was also there from ABAG. And so that really, really helped to to have that discussion. And, and um, the PBA 2050 staff said, yeah, you know, um, you have some legit um, issues here and we're going to work with your staff to reevaluate. And so, um, you know, of course the devil's in the details and that, uh, you know, we have until I believe it's December uh, to get all of our ducks in a row and, and, and put forth, you know, realistic uh, housing locations. Because what's so important about getting it right with with Plan Bay Area 2050 is that it will be used as the baseline to determine the arena numbers. And you know, so I, you know, I mentioned you know that that 2800 number that could potentially be our arena number in the next cycle if these areas aren't addressed. Because these, you know, areas like the the tape farm or the unregulated dump or ecology or uh, the, the PG&E uh, substation, even though it would be impossible for us to build housing there, they are, those areas are driving our numbers. So it's just like, it's so backwards. Um, but thank goodness that we had that meeting and the staff acknowledged the, the mis misinterpretation of, of these areas. And I, I feel confident that our staff can, can work with their staff to reevaluate those numbers so that's it oh i do have a question for for clay so uh clay uh, a lot of people have been talking about halloween and um so i, I did talk with noreen and I, I was hoping you and i could talk about it you know when, when we usually meet but i forgot to do it and so here we are at the council meeting but um you know the the, the guidelines or kind of like, you know, we want you to stay indoors, want you to do things, you know, with your family. But if you have to, you know, do trick or treating, this is how you should do it. You know, where there's like a bucket, you know, at someone's driveway. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I, I talked to Noreen about, you know, is that something that's feasible or, you, you know, people walk on one side of the street in a one way direction, like when you're at the county park and, the trail is okay one way this way and you can't you can't go uh on the trail in another direction because people are coming back down or, or coming one way that on that trail so one side of the street is is one way and the other side of the street is another way and kids are just, you know all wearing masks everyone's wearing masks and they're just getting candy out of a bucket from the uh, you know at the driveway so i, I know we, Sorry to put you on the spot there, but I mean, this is, you know, we're getting close and people have been asking, so. Yeah, I, I, Noreen talked to me and, you know, I mean, staff's perspective is that we should discourage people from being out and going tra traditional trick or treating. And that anything other than that is, you know, gonna create problems and, and uh, we're certainly concerned about a number of issues that were brought forward to us in terms and it's not specifically what you're speaking to, but, but in terms of closing streets and things of that nature, which we don't believe would be, would be appropriate. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk again next week. We've been talking, staff's been talking, you know, all along in terms of what, what's, you know, feasible, certainly, you know, people can do what they choose to do. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. 
and and we're not <laughs> we're not going to be out uh, apprehending uh, five year olds in costumes. So um, the uh, you know we're we're going to try to obviously if there's issues you know um, we'll deal with them um, and hopefully we will adhere to good safe practices. But um, you know I. I, I do understand that there's certainly for parents with the young children, uh, you know, the kind of the consternation over all this. And, but, um, you know, it is one year and uh, there are alternatives. Yeah, there, there's some cities that are banning it altogether. Yeah. I know that um, on the 29th, I don't know if you said this and I missed it, Clay, but on the 29th, which is a Thursday from three to seven, there's treats in the park. I saw a flyer at the um, farmer's market today, and it's like cornhole games and candy and some other type of stuff. So that's like a Halloween event, and I know that the BW is doing portraits um, behind the library on, I'm looking at the city website right now. Um, that's on the yeah. You're right. There's on the 20. I just got this. There's a on the 29th. There is a. Uh, I can read this. Um, treats in the park. Register at uh, treats in the park. <laughs> um, so that I'm not sure uh, you, what you just said in terms of the events. Probably what the event is. Um, yeah. But I don't have any more uh, information on that. We do have a. Um, um, a, a brochure here that's got um, kind of some of the events we talked about earlier as well as uh, that one um, and we'll make sure we get that out into our uh, the blast tomorrow so that people can see that and, and um, you know make sure we get as much information out as we can. There's some kind of scavenger hunt thing that I think you could probably print out. Um, so there's stuff that I think the city is doing to promote the Halloween spirit that people can partake in if they want to go for right. something that they feel a little bit more safe doing and i guess you know trick-or-treating is at your own risk and right really. clark do you have any committees to report on no i don't thank you um so i did have a couple meetings and since we really didn't haven't done this report in a couple three meetings because of the length of our prior meetings um i'm going to go back to one that cliff and i had with the sierra point design uh guidelines out at sierra point we did have a meeting where we discussed the park property that um i guess it's parcel r or t i think we renamed it at some point um, and that was discussing the future of that park area. And what was discussed was that uh, Public Works is asking to um, clear the brush that is on that parcel and make a small pathway so that it has some use while we go into the phase of trying to determine how that can work into the entire linear park um, that we have out at Sierra Point. So there was a recommendation from that subcommittee to do the maintenance on that park, uh, on that property, so that it is not just a um, eyesore, um, but we were not making any decisions on what the final use was and that we would bring that back to have more city discussion with the public where we can really hash out what the vision is for that area and what our citizens would like that park to look like. So right at this point, um, we were just recommending that normal maintenance be done on that park so that it wasn't a big fire hazard blob there at the end of the parking lot so um if you want to add anything else to that cliff um no you wrapped it up really nicely madam mayor so okay and, you and the location it's it's at sierra point it's the 
terminus of the main road going in where we own the park area that we've gotten some money from development funds to to incorporate that into public space and park lands. And we're not making a decision on what to do with it, just that we need it to to be cleared off of the shrubbery, the weeds that are growing on it and made a little more aesthetically pleasing. And it's basically a maintenance project. So we didn't need to get any funds. It's it's a maintenance project just to make it where it is looks like it belongs to us instead of it's just being ramshackle. And then I also had an airport noise subcommittee. And that was fairly interesting. While air traffic is down, passenger traffic is down 80 percent. The cargo is up tremendously. So that's why we're still hearing the planes. And that's why we still have quite a bit of flights going overhead. So the airport is rebounding quite a bit with cargo flights. And I think they're taking advantage of that at the moment to do some some runway improvements. One thing that came up that I would sort of like a input from the council is they are thinking of redoing the airport roundtable again to include some of our southern cities. And it would require that they redo the entire agreement between the cities and to bring in other voting members. And it would need to be ratified by each council before it could take place. I am personally, while it's difficult to say, I think personally it's a bad idea. We have two or three southern cities that have been basically taking over our meetings with with their arrival noise. And what happened, Terry? So I think the full council probably would agree with you. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to get a little to mark what direction we wanted to go in so that when we have this meeting, it is, you know, I'm not just speaking on my own behalf, but that I have a little council buy in on this because I think it's going to be a touchy, a touchy discussion. But, you know, people who while all noise is noise and we understand we can't be shifting arrival or departure noise. It's a completely different animal. I was also a point of put my hand up to be on the strategic planning committee for the airport noise roundtable. That's just a temporary ad hoc committee. And I need to get my main points in in the next two or three days to take back to that meeting. So if there is anything that the council would like the airport roundtable to work on, please contact me offline or just to let me know what you think a strategic plan for the next three to five years, what we're going to put into that plan. Let me know so that I can try to represent our interests on that committee. The other thing that I wanted to bring up from that, and I know I'm going on quite a bit about it. In February, there's going to be a symposium on noise and specifically airport noise. And they have opportunities for both council members, roundtable people and citizens to attend. It's a fairly inexpensive between $50 and $150, depending on what kind of organization you are with. And I would like our couple of our citizens, if they're willing to do it, to be able to attend this and get reimbursed by the city so that they come back because they give me so much information. And I'd be really happy to have them be able to participate. I think the cost would be very low 
you know, maybe two or three hundred dollars total that again, I'd just like to see if that's something the council would entertain to allow our citizens to get this education. So is that Gary? Pardon? When is that happening? It's happening in February. Oh, OK. So the symposium is. You'd have to bring back on agenda, I think, right? Because it's I don't think that that cost is something that would require that. But I'll look at the city manager. I just wanted to let people know that I think that we could empower our citizens group to really be more proactive and better citizen engagers because they've got more and more knowledge than any of us. Is that right? Yeah, unless unless somebody has an objection to that, I'm fine with that. I'll just work with the mayor and the appropriate people. Right. Oh, and with that, that's I'm sure I'm leaving out a couple of subcommittees, but that's all I'm going to call out on. Go ahead, Karen. Quick question for you. Why don't those southern cities do a separate roundtable? I mean, you're absolutely right. They're two completely different animals. So why don't they have an arrivals roundtable? I mean, I get it. It's a very different animal altogether. Well, it's it's very different. And they, you know, our roundtable is their their charter is to address noise in and around San Francisco SFO. They are out of our circle. And they it's it is SFO noise that they're hearing. It's not just from San Jose Airport. San Jose is starting their own roundtable. They haven't really gotten off the ground very well yet. But there's also talk of including the San Jose roundtable in ours, which I think would make it a group that is so unwieldy that nothing would ever get done. Correct. Correct. But yeah, that's something we can discuss offline. Sure. But it's I'm sure an issue that Cliff understands. Yes, I do. I will definitely be reaching out to you, Madam Mayor. OK, great. Well, with that, do we have any other reports out or council matters? Seeing none, we'll move on to the city council meeting schedule. Can the city clerk put that up? So we have the event that all council members have been invited to, which is the dedication ceremony, New Brisbane Library dedication ceremony on the 24th at 10 a.m. There's also a proposed cancellation for December 3rd and December 17th with a new proposed special meeting for December 10th. And do we know when we expect to do the council changeover? We I understand that election results may not be in until 17 days after the election. But do we have a date for the the attempted swear in? Well, the the attempted swear. That just didn't sound right. The swearing in would take place at the special meeting on December 10th. So we that's why we canceled December 3rd and November 19th would we would usually do like a workshop ahead of time with the council and any new member to talk about the reorganization. If results are not sufficient at that point in time, I suppose we'll have to try to move that closer to the December 10th or whenever we feel we have a, you know, a good understanding who's going to be on the council. So that part will just have to play a little bit by ear. But the swearing in will take place on December 10th. OK, thank you very much. And with that, do we have any written communications? Madam Mayor, we had two over the last couple of weeks. We got one from Chris Quigley regarding the acquirement of myocardia and Barbara Ebel regarding Brisbane Halloween street closure. 
Thank you. And are there any members of the public who would like to speak on oral communications number two? There are no text messages, emails, or any members of the public wishing to speak. Thank you. And you're saying three, three more meetings. Is that what you're holding up, Clark? Three meetings, I'm out. Congratulations. Don't count down too quick. That brings us. Yes. Yes. City attorney. You can move that out of order if you like. Well, I would, what I'd really like to do is ask for a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. And a second by council member Lentz. Yes. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Good night. Good night.